Alright, welcome back. This is part three of the oil painting tutorial. And as I said, I'm going to be talking about working up a tonal underdrawing for this painting. This is the sketch, and since the last part, I worked it over a little bit more, got things where I wanted them. As I pointed out many times in the last part, the sketch is not identical to the photo. There are certain things that I've changed and made made the way I want them as opposed to the way they are in the reference image. For example, I wanted to have the duck's body turned a little bit more this way um, than pointing as much straight ahead as it is. So I have just compensated a little bit thought about this thing in three dimensions and drawn it in at a slightly different angle. And depending on your confidence level and your skill level with drawing three-dimensionally, that may be something that you have to wait to try to do. Um, when you're learning how to do some of this stuff, you may just have to do some kind of slavish um, studies from the photos without deviating much until you get a better hang of what you're doing, but I, I feel like it's okay to move things around and change them to make them the way you want them. Um, so this is the sketch. This is not really what you would technically call a drawing yet. Instead, it's just um, a, a linear suggestion of the elements of the composition and the drawing is a much more tonal piece. It's almost like a painting that's done in charcoal and chalk. So what I'm going to do now is this is my sketch layer. I'm going to call it sketch just so I know what it is and then I'm going to lock it down. We're pretty much done with that. Now I'm going to create a new layer, and it's going to be called it's going to be called underdrawing. With the charcoal tool that I started with, I am going to be laying in highlight and shadow based approximately on my reference drawing, but again, not exactly true to it. And just to keep things from getting too confused, I'm going to fade out my sketch layer a little bit. I'm going to turn down the opacity to about 50%, lock it again, so that I'm not confusing the black of the sketch drawing with the black that I'm going to put in in the true underdrawing. With a charcoal tool like I've made here, if you have, if you press D, in Photoshop, it gives you the default color scheme, which is black as the foreground color and white as the background color. If you press X, it swaps foreground and background color. So when you're doing a tonal drawing, it is very helpful to keep one hand on the keyboard and swap back and forth between black and white, because then you have charcoal and chalk, essentially and our background image is 50% gray, which is like tone paper, so you can leave the, let the tone of the, the mid-tone of the background show through and concentrate on accentuating highlights and shadows. The other thing we're going to be introducing in this stage is a blending tool. Um, I use a blending tool that I got from a natural media tool preset kit called NKS3. Um, but if you, and, and I highly recommend that anyone <clears throat> who's interested in natural media emulation in Photoshop get NKS3. But if you don't want to go to that trouble and you still want a blending tool, you, you're going to use the smudge tool. If you select the smudge tool, um, typically speaking, the smudge tool is not good for much. If you have colors and you select the smudge tool 
it, it acts on a very, 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 very small working area. And look how much I'm working over these two things, and they're not mixing together, not in any appreciable way. The secret to making the smudge tool useful is going into your brush palette, and for this we're going to want probably a soft airbrush. You can see in this area, this is pretty much a default soft brush. The key here is scattering. You want scattering, you want it on both axes, and look at, look at the difference that this makes. You can see it's actually starting to blend because it's grabbing from either side of where you put down the cursor and trying to interpolate them. The only problem is that this is very processor intensive. Um, it, and on my computer it's slow. Uh, if you, your computer is probably newer than mine, so um, uh, you probably won't, it probably won't slow down quite as much. But I have a tool preset that is a soft stump and it's slow but it's very effective at blending these two colors. So this blending tool in default by default in Photoshop there is no hotkey that goes to the smudge tool because even the people at Adobe know that no one uses it. But I bound a hotkey. I put it in the key letter S for smudge and then I'm going to be switching back and forth between B for the brush tool for my charcoal and chalk and S for the smudge tool which I would be blending on the canvas. Very similar to what you would be doing with a real charcoal drawing. Now, let's start looking at the tonal, the main tonal elements that we're going to want to capture. There is a standard traditional scale of tones. It's called the Munsell scale. And I believe it's eight steps between, or nine steps, counting zero being white and nine being black, with with eight eight steps in, or seven steps in between with intermediate shades of gray. Generally speaking, you do not ever, ever want pure white or pure black in your drawing because um, it will, it, it's very rare in real life that you perceive brilliant bright white unless you are looking at a magnesium welding you know or or looking right at a light bulb or looking directly at the sun I mean that that degree of whiteness almost never occurs in nature there are tiny tiny occurrences where you might use it like the glint of the sun off of a highly reflective metal surface or or little teeny catch lights where you might, might want to use pure white and the same thing is true of pure black it, it is so dark that in most situations in which there is some ambient light there's not going to be anything close to pure pure black so you're instead going to want to, going to, want to think of your tonal range as going from a light gray to a dark gray so if you look at the reference image here, um, probably the darkest elements of the image are going to be the, the, the dark part of the alligator's eye, the shadowed portion of the cloth, and this cloth is actually double-sided, so it's, it's, um, you can see that it's a bit, it's kind of like white on black on one side and black and white on the other, so this is the, the shadowed portion of this. There's a little bit of a bar of very, very dark, very close to black over here. And then there are the um, occluding areas. Occlusion is like where things are touching. You have the places where the forms occlude the surface, and that's where you get the sensation of a line that's under the form. So we can start very lightly kind of brushing in, oh, oh, some black, kind of brushing in some darks. 
the flow control is down very low. I'm even going to bring it lower because I do not want to overdo my shadows at all. Start laying in The other thing that you want to keep in mind is that you don't want the shadow to eat into the to the form. So suppose you have a, a form like this and it's sitting on a surface. There's there's a there's a tendency if you're putting in the occlusal the occlusal shadow to nudge it up inside the form. Don't do that. You're you're going to shade the form a little bit later, but when it comes to the place where it touches keep it outside the form. Make sure that you keep it, keep the form intact and solid. It helps keep the form looking solid and keeps it from just transforming back into lines on a page. So when I go into this duck and where it contacts the paper, I'm just going to start suggesting some of the shadow. I'm going to go into my blending tool and fade that out a little bit. Same thing with the bottom of the alligator where it touches the paper. I'm not going to go through the entire exercise of doing the entire tonal drawing on camera because um, this is something that you just kind of have to work out for yourself. But I'll just show you the main principles so that when I go back and do the rest of it, I'm not going to bring it back and have you saying, what, what the heck happened? You can see this is the cast shadow of the jaw. Get a little bit of a cast shadow. This was taken, this photo was taken with natural light, and it's a cloudy day, so the light's very diffused. The light is also, it doesn't have a yellowish sunlit hue. It is pretty close to just being plain white light. And because the direction of the window is the windows above and behind this picture, the, the part of the alligator skull that is closest to us is going to be the most in shadow. So I'm starting to think about that. <clears throat> One of the things that starts to take shape with the tonal underdrawing is the phenomenon of different forms of edges. This edge where the back of the alligator's head meets the paper is very very crisp and sharp and when it comes time to render that I am going to probably use a really really sharp eraser to keep it crisp because it's one of the things that gives it that interesting definition. Now, the interior space of the alligator's jaw is a little darker than the... I'm actually going to switch to back to my fast blender. It can get very tricky to gauge some of these tonal relationships. Because it tone is a is a relative phenomenon. The way that one tone looks against another can make it look much darker than it would be otherwise. So when you're working up a tonal drawing you want to think about not just what is this tone on a scale of 1 to 9 or on a scale of 0 to, to 9 but of does it look right relative to 
the tones that it's abutting directly. So, so the darkness of the back of the alligator's head is much darker. It, it looks much darker and looks more defined and sharper because it's against this empty field of the, the gray construction paper. And likewise, there is really nothing on the duck's head that gets anywhere close to the amount of definition of the alligator or the amount of darkness of the alligator, um, except maybe the occlusal um, shadow where it touches the paper. And that occupies a very small pro proportion of its overall area. I'm just going to start putting in a little bit looser, rougher suggestions of tone. The alligator's head is, generally speaking, pretty dark. It's, it's as a whole, the darkest element of the composition. So I'm going to be just putting in, laying in a kind of overall tone of gray and then worry a little bit more about the more specific highlights and shadows in a minute or two. If you take care with your tonal drawing, you will accomplish a degree of realism that will surprise you because the way that the little occlusal shadows work, the way that forms pass in front of each other and intersect each other, and the way that the light is interrupted is a very strong component of what makes something look real. I'm going to make enlarge my brush size here for a minute. I'm going to lay in a little bit of a base tone on the stool here because it's in shadow. As with everything else I'm I'm doing, I'm thinking a lot about the natural media equivalent to what I'm doing. When you work with charcoal, you, you do a lot of blending and a lot of scumbling and um, with, with digital painting you have the option of color picking your way out of certain issues. When you have charcoal it's just a big old stick of black and you put it and you lay it down and then you kind of blur it or, or smudge it into the tone that you want it to be and you mix it with white and you erase it out. You, you don't have 300 different charcoal sticks of different shades of gray. Usually not. I mean there's a little bit of that but it's for the most part you're working with straight black and then you're smudging and and rubbing away and that's the way I'm approaching this. I'm just putting in more black and then um, smudging and erasing out where I don't want it or smudging to diffuse it into the gray that's closer to what it's supposed to be. And when we start adding highlights in a minute, um, that becomes even more realistic of adding chalk over charcoal, of adding the white over the black to make gray instead of just color picking a gray that seems right. Now, you might think that that's inefficient, um, because why not just use the color picking ability if you have it, but again, I, I like to, I think that there's value in emulating the traditions of natural media because the there's so much wisdom that was discovered 
for the working methods of these natural media that if we can use them, why not use them instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. Alright, I'm going to pause the video for a little bit and I'm going to do a little bit more work on the shadow element and when I come back I'm going to be looking at um, a little bit more about fleshing out the highlights. Alright, and then by the magic of television um, we're back and uh, I can show you at least you can, you can see what the difference has been since I was broadcasting before. Um, the I'll just go over a few of the things that I a few of the choices that I made for where to put in shadows. First of all, the cloth here has a very complex texture and pattern on it, and I'm not even going to attempt to emulate that for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it it would be so labor intensive that it would take forever, and there's also no need for it because. Um, the the you want the eye to go to this to the objects of interest and you don't want something that's going to be very busy and competing with the places where where your eye is going and the other thing the other fact being that when your eye goes focuses on something everything else in your field of view kind of fades out and gets blurry it you can't really notice that that's happening but it's a fact so there's if you look at the paintings of some of the great master painters. Um, the, the person who is my my complete hero for this is John Singer Sargent. He puts detail only where it's necessary and everything else outside of it can get kind of schmeary. And, um, and that's pretty much okay because he had an understanding, as many of them did, that you only need to worry about detail in p places where the eye is going to go. So usually um, human faces, d very distinct features, pretty much the human eye, the human eyes and the mouth. And so the, a lot of the same phenomena are going to be true um, in this painting, even though there aren't human forms. Um, the other thing that I did is I went and sculpted in the edge of this head using a hard eraser, which I usually don't use, as I mentioned in the last section, um, just to give it that that nice um, contrast with the background. So um, there are places where things get very dark and if you look at where the piece of paper is sitting here, the little places where it folds up, the places where you can see the paper, the, where the paper contacts the surface it's on, contributes enormously to giving the illusion of the particular physical attributes of this substance, the, of the, what this surface is. You look at this and it's really easy to see that it's a piece of paper. There's a little crease here which I wanted to to get at because it, it when you see that you know immediately that you're looking at a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard and not a sheet of glass or a piece of wood. Same thing with this little curved up corner in the back. I wanted to maintain that and even exaggerate it a little bit because um, it helps lend that element of realism. Now, now I'm going to switch over to highlights. Um, this, th this particular reference photo has a narrow, relatively narrow gamut of, of tone. There's not a whole lot of sharp highlights on this. The, as far as I can see, the lightest thing in the image is a there's a, a highlighted corner of this paper that gradually fades into the background there are a couple of little reflective or specular highlights on the surface of the duck and there is um, a generally white tone to the rope it's it maintains a kind of light color um, against the the background there are a few little highlightish places on the alligator's head, but it's not a particularly reflective surface. So the places where I do add white, it's going to be probably smudged down into the ground to make it a bit um, a bit grayer than it would otherwise be. So I'm just going to start laying in a little bit of white where I want some highlights. It's this is when I put it in, it's much 
more dramatic than what it'll be when I blend it out. Tends to get, tends to mellow out pretty fast. You can um, do your highlights and your shadows on separate layers if you want. Um, I'm not afraid of doing most things on a single layer and just erasing and blending when I need to, but it's Photoshop. You can have as many layers as your computer can handle. If you want to have more layers, if you feel more comfortable that way, then go for it. I'm just going to very, very lightly. I have flow down to pen pressure on my tablet or on the uh, brush controls so that if I stroke very lightly I don't lay down that much material at a time. And there's a little bit of a highlight on the duck's beak on the top of his head. Because the light is coming from behind there's a bit of a backlight effect. I'm going to exaggerate this a bit because I've, I've painted myself into a corner here because I wanted to have the duck's body turned a little bit. As a result, there's something being illuminated in my composition that I don't have a reference for. In my reference image, you can't really see the back of the duck, and in the composition that I chose, you can see it a little bit more, so I'm going to make up where in my opinion, the light would be would be coming from. And I'm actually even gonna erase this out a little bit. Because I don't even want it to be that dramatic. I just want it to be very subtle. It's really just the slightest suggestion of a highlight that fades out into the background. I can turn down the flow even lower so that it takes a lot of going over the same area to lay down very much at all. And that's probably for the best in this situation, so that I don't overdo my highlights. So a little bit of a highlight right there. A little bit of where it peeks through. And the other element that would be highlighted would be the, um, or at least somewhat lighter than the rest of the composition, would be the alligator's teeth. But I don't want to start getting into that right now. I actually want to do the teeth probably last, the last thing in the entire painting. I, I can see where they are in the reference image, and that's pretty much enough for me. I'm just going to leave them out because they're going to get very obnoxious to keep track of. There are places where the outlines of your sketch layer, you're going to want to go over them because, for example, where this duck's head touches the, um, uh, you know, uh, goes up against the, the background, it's a highlight and you don't want to have the dark outline counteracting the fact that this is really a highlight situation.
I'm, I'm going to take a minute here to just step back and look at the piece as a whole. And um, I think that I've got highlights pretty much everywhere I want them at this point. They're, they're not, highlights don't represent that substantial a component of this particular composition. There's just not, it's, it's a very middling tonal range. And in fact, I'm going to want to push the shadows a little bit darker in the region surrounding the areas of interest because I want the area of interest to pop out a little bit more. So I'm going to switch back to my charcoal and I'm just going to very roughly go over this area, darken it up. You can see in the photo that that there's some rather light areas down underneath the stool and in the background, but those are distracting and as I as I've said a hundred times by now, just because it's in the photo doesn't mean you have to put it in the painting. In fact, sometimes you want to leave stuff out, you want to cheat, you want to change things around because you want to call attention to your subject. The overall background up here is also very, very light gray. I have my, my charcoal, but I have the flow control on very, very light, just so that I can darken this up ever so slightly from the gray that I had it started at. I might even go back in and erase a bit out so that it's not too dark. There's just a subtle difference between the, the dark of the... Um, the cardboard here, the, the construction paper here, and the dark of the background, and I kind of want to make that stand out. You see, this is not necessarily pretty, but I'm going to go back in here with a very, very soft eraser and uh, just kind of dial that back a little bit. And um, again, this is the kind of thing that you can spend as much or as little time as you want. Um, I get very impatient. I like to move on. I, um, and the other thing is that you're going to be painting over this. That's the thing to remember. You're going to be painting over this. And as far as I'm concerned, for the amount of energy that you're going to put into the final painting, um, don't take too much time with this stage unless it's there, there's some extremely complex interplay of light and shadow and you need to spend some time really studying it because um, you know there's only so much that you can do before you are going to kind of lose it when you do the painting on top. I mean you, you can do it as a study I mean certainly speaking you can you can work it all day if you want and you can learn a lot that way and you can even do it just as a charcoal drawing and forget the painting but um, if you're doing the oil painting I think you reach a certain point where for example I'm not gonna go in here and and render the texture of this alligator skin in light and shadow I'm just not gonna do that I'm going to try to do as much of a block in on the on the main tonal regions as I can and then I'm going to, to think about the detail when I get a little bit further along on the oil painting stage of this.
Now I'm even going to want to drop this under the stool even more. Really, really drop it out. Make it much darker so that the surface gets that very strong impression that it's catching the light. I'm also going to go over the areas of the cloth that are not in direct light and darken them out a little bit more so that the piece of paper pops out and the places where the light does hit it have a, an exaggerated reflective look. Alright, I think that this is a good place to stop, and in the next segment I'm going to be talking about the um, burnt umber underpainting, so really starting, finally starting the painting component of this piece. So stay tuned for that, and I hope you've enjoyed this so far.